This week we're going to talk about Hoover, a very enigmatic character. And I entitled this talk, Hoover's Last Stand. America Rides the Rails, the River Rouge Riots, and the Bonus Expeditionary Force. Now, Herbert Hoover was inaugurated in March of 1929, seven months before the crash. When Hoover was inaugurated, both he and Henry Ford were two of the most admired men in America. By 1932, they were both two of the most reviled men in the country. The American middle class was numbed by what had just happened. They continued for some time in a state of shock. Bewilderment, denial, hostages to a dream gone bad. Like the society described by Sinclair Lewis and Babbitt, the salesmen, the Toastmasters, the Rotarians, the Kiwanians, boosters, retailers, and all played by the rules. They had joined enthusiastically in the great game of consumerism. And the stock market was a gift that just kept on giving. There was no end to the infinite possibility of doubling, tripling, and quadrupling your wealth by simply margining stock purchases with just 10% of your own equity. And then just watching the tape as your worth caroomed up exponentially. Clearly God had meant for us all to become rich. If not, then why would he have given us this wonderful toy? But now suddenly all of the artificially created paper assets had vanished. They had been wiped out by an unanswerable margin calls as the market plummeted literally overnight to depths never before dreamed of. Now there was nothing for the businessmen to sell. There was nothing for the great boosters to boost. But sadly, the wiped out businessmen still continue to hopefully gaze at the tape transfixed day after day as if by some miraculous happening, it could all be restored. Now there was no basis even for dreaming. Our entire value system had been shaken to the core. The clarion call of the Harding and Coolidge administrations had been self-reliance, and the economy had thrived. Hoover had echoed the sentiment in his inaugural address that March, and in fact, his life was itself a shining example of the heights that could be attained by making the best possible use of one's God-given talents. Who then was this man, Hoover? What led to his downfall? Why is he reviled so? In my judgment, Hoover is perhaps one of the most misunderstood of all our presidents. Of humble origins, Hoover was born in Iowa in 1874. He was orphaned at the age of 10, raised by austere Quaker relatives in a number of locations in the far west. The values they imparted were an interesting mix. The Quakers believed in self-reliance, and though God-fearing, they were not opposed to worldly success. But they also believed for firmly that one who had been enriched by society had a duty to give back. Perhaps because his fate as a youth was so out of his control, Hoover was preoccupied with orderliness. Despite lack of means, he was fortuitously able to enroll in Stanford University when the university was just starting and it was in search of students. He was still all the more fortunate to matriculate because of a marked deficiency in English, which is a deficiency that would continue to haunt him for the remainder of his life. At Stanford, Hoover aligned himself with the anti-fraternity group known as the Barbarians, not with the legatees of privilege. Graduating as an engineer, his first job was as a blue-collar laborer in a mine. He then accepted a position in the Pacific as a mining engineer. Over the next several years, Hoover worked in mining operations all over the globe, and then his career took off as he began to develop his own mines. He was an absolutely brilliant Renaissance man, proving adept as both a financier, a geologist, a promoter, an engineer, and a metallurgist. By the age of 29, Herbert Hoover was already worth over $4 million. He was also world famous and would eventually earn the title the Great Engineer. At a time when most men were just beginning their careers, it was already time for Hoover 
to start giving back to society. And the devout Quaker now turned his manifold talents to the service of his fellow man. Hoover's accomplishments were just beginning. His activities during and after the World War, organizing, directing the Commission for the Relief of Belgium, became the stuff of legends. He was singularly credited with saving more than nine million Belgian lives from starvation. Little Belgium, despite its neutrality, had been overrun by the Germans during the war. As fate would have it, its geographic location placed it directly in the path of the so-called Schlieffen Plan, a plan developed by the German high command early in the 20th century to outflank and then attack Paris from the north. The Belgian civilians suffered agonizingly as a result. Hoover continued his relief efforts after the war as head of the American Relief Administration. His post-war relief effort was credited with saving millions of lives, and he was now hailed in addition as the great humanitarian, first the great engineer and the great humanitarian. Following the debacle that came to be known as Versailles, John Maynard Keynes declared that Hoover was the only man who emerged from the ordeal of Versailles with an enhanced reputation. Hoover had not yet entered politics, but he was greatly sought after by both parties, particularly by progressives in each party. His reputation was essentially as a progressive. He's truly a wonder, wrote Woodrow Wilson's assistant secretary of the Navy. I wish we could make him president. There wouldn't be a better one. At the time, Hoover was undecided to his party affiliation. Later, of course, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, that assistant secretary of the Navy, would change his mind. But by this time, Hoover was already the Republican presidential nominee and well on his way to the White House. The Democrats tried to draft Hoover in 1920, but after some carefully orchestrated fence sitting, he eventually chose the Republican Party, and he thereafter served ably as Secretary of Commerce in both the Harding and Coolidge administrations. Ironically, Hoover was perhaps the most proactive Secretary of Commerce in history. Contrary to the myths that have persisted about Hoover, he was not a strict laissez-faire economist. There was a recession in 1920 to 22, and thanks to Hoover, the Harding administration was proactive in adopting measures to counteract it. When he took office in 1928 and before the market crash, Hoover proposed a prosperity reserve fund to be put away in good times out of excess government income to provide jobs when times weren't so good. It was reminiscent of the biblical Joseph's interpretation of Pharaoh's dream. Remember that about the fat cows and the lean cows, which resulted in the Egyptians storing grain against the coming famine? Hoover favored a graduated income tax as well, and heavy taxation of inheritances for the deliberate purpose of disintegrating large fortunes. These policies were hardly policies we associate with Republicans and conservatism. Hoover had a vision for America. It was a vision of self-reliance, but not one of doggy dog devil take the hindmost individualism. To the contrary, his was a vision, naive perhaps, of a unique American blend of socially responsible individualists. Read his book, American Individualism. In that book, he defined his credo this way. I believe we in America are developing a new economic thought, a new basis of community action of cooperation. He clung to the belief, which was shared by a great many Americans, that people could be persuaded to cooperate voluntarily, to share to help their neighbors, and that coercion by government was unnecessary. And that, in fact, counterproductive in this regard was the interference by government. But at the same time, basically, he was disillusioned by what he saw as oppressive government interference and intervention in Europe. During his candidacy in 1928, he began to move further and further to the right, denouncing the many failures of government's tyrannical interference in business as undermining the very instincts that carry a people forward to progress. So where was the flaw? 
Where was the crack in the armor? What caused the Greek tragedy that became Herbert Hoover? Well, one major flaw, perhaps the fatal one, was a capacity for self-delusion and an inability to admit failure. His life, his organizational skills, his humanitarianism had been a model of order and perfection. According to Robert McElvain, Hoover constructed his values into a closed system and would not let events or facts upset his ideal vision. His system, unlike the real world, was based on rationality, but he was irrational in the defense of it. When the Depression descended on this country, Hoover sought to elicit from the American people a vast voluntary effort, like that he had marshaled both during and after the Great War to save Europe. He wanted at all costs to avoid the demoralizing effects of a federal dole. Hoover deviated from this rigid position at one time by establishing the Reconstruction Finance Corporation to lend money to the banks and a business to try to jumpstart the economy on sort of a trickle-down theory. But he was not willing to deal with unemployment, and during the Depression, he steadfastly refused to believe that farmers in Arkansas were actually starving to death. They were. In the early 30s, this led to a tragic anomaly. The Hoover administration provided a federal feed program for the hogs and cattle in Arkansas in order to help jumpstart business. But at the same time, it denied food to starving farmers who were raising the pigs in these very same communities. Their hogs could eat, but the poor farmers couldn't. What an anomaly. Hoover maintained with regard to farmers' unemployment relief that he was worried about destroying people's self-reliance and spiritual responses. McIlvain quipped, hogs and bankers, it seemed, were in one category, while the farmers and the unemployed were in another. Hoover saw no danger of undermining the independence and self-respect of the hogs and the bankers, but was more solicitous of the farmers and unemployed spiritual health. McIlvain then concluded regarding the tragedy of Hoover, that Hoover's greatest virtue may have been his consistency but his worst defect was his rigidity. Bruce Kuklick, in a book called The Good Ruler, makes this parallel observation about Hoover. Hoover had cultivated a certain civic personality, and it stood him in good stead until 1929. After the crash, Hoover's symbiotic relationship with the public changed. In an altered political ecology, he could not viably function. His natural reserve that had signified dignity and restraint now came to look like arrogance, indifference, paralysis, gloom. Nothing more vividly illustrates Kuklick's conclusion than, of course, the example we gave of Hoover tragically allowing Arkansas farmers to starve, sometimes to death, while at the same time supplying ample feed for their hogs. When he was elected, Hoover was idolized as the prototypical engineering statesman and the perfect president for the so-called new era of social scientific rationality. As the Depression wore on, however, the people demanded spiritual encouragement and a fighting faith. Hoover's great failure was that he could provide neither. Bitter jokes circulated about Hoover's unpopularity and personal failures. When Babe Ruth in 1930 made $80,000, a friend reminded them he now made more money than the President of the United States. So what, retorted the Babe, I had a better year. <laughs> Hoover asked the Secretary of the Treasury for a nickel to phone a friend. The secretary purported to reply, here, take two, call them both. <laughs> this was the atmosphere in the rarefied and removed climate of Washington. What was then happening on the ground, on the highways and byways of our land? Well, on the ground, we began to see things in our society that had never existed before. Things that no one had imagined could happen were happening here. The suicide rate, which one of you asked about last week, 
between 1929 and 1932 rose from 13.9 per 100,000 population to 17.4. T.H. Watkins gives us a glimpse of why. The survivors could be seen everywhere, resolutely dressing for business each morning, reading the classified ads, penciling circles around likely items, leaving their homes and apartments with the marked up newspapers folded under their arms, mimicking the attitudes of success as they purposely marched off to stand in line in employment agencies and business firms, waiting for hours for interviews during which both parties understood the emptiness of the ritual, but dared not let truth steal in for fear it could not be endured. Each day their suits grew a little more worn, a little less clean, their shoes a little less bright, their strides a little less brisk. Pretty soon, Watkins goes on, these tattered remnants of our once proud middle class no longer bothered to congregate in the overheated rooms of the employment agencies. Thick as they were with cigarette smoke, frayed tempers, frantic clerks, and anxious applicants. More often than not, they just walked the streets or sat unmoving on park benches, staring hungrily at the begging pigeons and wondering what they could tell the family when they returned that night. Psychiatrists noted that the stress on family life was incalculable. Frantic fear led to marital incompatibility. Alcoholism, total loss of self-esteem, impotence among men, and suicide. A noted sociologist, Mira Komarovsky, observed that even at the end of the decade of the 30s, there were still high levels of impotence among men. The feeling of disturbance and humiliation apparently exists. Irrespective of the intellectual convictions of the man, in his own estimation, he fails to fulfill the very touchstone of his manhood, the role of family provider. Well, if Hoover wouldn't help, who would? The International Apple Shippers Association, for one. They had an idea but it was not exactly a selfless idea. In October 1930, there was a surfeit of apples in the Pacific Northwest. A box contained 72 apples. In the morning, the apple shippers would sell the box on 100% credit to an unemployed businessman, or salesman, housewife, or whoever showed up for $1.75. The unemployed person could sell the apples for a nickel apiece and make a profit of $1.85 after returning the box to the warehouse and paying off his $1.75 debt. The apple shippers even coined a clever slogan to help their vendees. Buy an apple a day, eat the depression away. The system paid off for the apple shippers. Almost overnight, there were tens of thousands of apple sellers hawking apples from coast to coast. At one time, there were 6,000 apple sellers lined up on the streets of New York alone. It did not pay off quite so well for the unfortunate apple sellers. Suppliers' greed set in. The apple shippers raised the price of the box from $1.75 to $2.25, which reduced the profit potential to $1.35 a box. Subtract the three or four bad apples in each box, subway or bus fare to and from the warehouse, and to and from the apple stand, there wasn't much left. Nevertheless, Hoover's Labor Department, anxious to show that an agent was getting better and back to work, removed these poor apple sellers from the statistics of the unemployed. The apple sellers soon disappeared, but not before thousands of Americans had become part of the apple selling legend and a mark of the Great Depression. One of you asked about them last week. Increasingly, living conditions for many became intolerable and homes non-existent. Many of the homeless, as in the city of New York, simply walked the streets, slept on park benches in men's and women's rooms and train stations, flop houses, and finally, what came to be known as Hoovervilles. These were shanty towns, usually constructed of wood packing crates, cardboard boxes, and tin cans, whatever else was discarded. They were often located on the outskirts of towns and villages throughout the country, and they were named in mockery of the president in New York City, for example, there were dozens of shanty towns along the Hudson below Riverside Drive. Dozens more along the two rivers. Many more in the empty lots of the Bronx and the flats of Brooklyn. But I never saw these. 
I did not grow up in New York. I know about these New York Hoovervilles only from books, but I did grow up in the suburbs of Cleveland, Ohio, and I lived through the heart of the Depression there. And as a kid, I can vividly recall that there was a woods about a quarter of a mile from our Linfield Road house, which we called the Scottsdale Woods. I was warned by my parents, as were my little friends by their parents, never to go there. There were people living there in shacks and they had guns. Dangerous vagrants, I was told. They might shoot me on sight. But like all kids everywhere, this prohibition merely piqued our curiosity. And on the theory that in numbers there is strength, a gang of us tentatively sneaked into the woods one day to see for ourselves. I don't know how many of you remember Red Skelton. He had the mean little kid who said, if I do it, I get a weapon. I do it. That was us. Well, we snuck in about 100 yards into the woods, scampered down a dirt path, and hid behind a clump of trees near a clearing. Peering out from behind the trees, we saw shanty huts made of wood, tin cans, rubber tires, cardboard boxes, and packing crates, just like those in the Hoovervilles in New York City. But these Cleveland squatters appeared to be hill people. I realized later on they'd come up from Kentucky, Tennessee, and West Virginia to work in the steel mills and auto assembly plants on the flats of downtown Cleveland along the Cuyahoga River. Now they were out of work and no doubt had been evicted from their meager rental housing down in the city. We saw campfires and people cooking things, squirrels, rabbits, and the like. Of course, we didn't stay long because we were peering out from behind a clump of trees and we were very scared. Over the years, imagination does things to one's memory. But I still vividly remember the scene, and I now realize what we're seeing. These were not vicious killers. To my knowledge, nobody was ever killed there, come to think of it. Never even heard of anybody getting hurt in there. Undoubtedly, we were seeing the very kinds of people that populated shanties on the outskirts of towns all over the country at the time. Forlorn, desperate people, out of work, the driven, the dispossessed, probably more afraid of us than we were of them. Many Americans similarly evicted and otherwise unsatisfied with their lot took to the roads. They traveled by thumb. Highways and streets were filled with hitchhikers with their thumbs out. The phrase thumbing a ride became part of our vernacular. But a great number of Americans took to the rails. And so it was that there developed along the rail lines of our country a unique subculture. People were seeking an escape, perhaps to catch a glimmer of hope elsewhere than in their hometown. Surely the grass must be greener elsewhere. This was America, after all, the land of unlimited opportunity. We had always been a people on the move anyway. It was in our blood. After all, hadn't the West been settled by people who couldn't stay put in the East? Hadn't they pushed westward, seeking opportunity all the way west to California and then all the way up to Alaska? Millions of non-settling types, migrant farm workers, had always followed the crops all over the country, from the potato harvests in Maine to the cranberry bogs of Massachusetts, the beet fields of Michigan, the wheat harvests in Kansas, tomato harvests in Florida. It was in our blood. They were joined on the boxcars by an infinite number of wanderers to whom work was merely incidental, hobos they called themselves. Hobos had their own traditions, their own systems of communication, their own brotherhood dating back to just after the Civil War. There was even a national hobo convention held in Britt, Iowa in 1933. But during the Depression, the ranks of these migrant workers and hobos were swollen by the flow of the desperate. They would climb onto boxcars, destination anywhere, and just go. At one point in the Depression, officials of the Southern Pacific Railroad, the Santa Fe, the Great Northern, and the Union Pacific reported that 683,000 transients had been found riding their freights up and down, back and forth in California and the interior west. They estimated that any freight train would be carrying more riders at any given time than the sleek passenger trains like the 20th Century Limited or the California Zephyr. Watkins quoted a notable hobo of the day. Maury Steam Train Graham, 
who had gone on the bum in 1931, and who ironically observed, it was not at all unusual to see a train headed in one direction, loaded with transients traveling in search of work, pass another train with just as many job seekers aboard going in the opposite direction, neither group knowing that there was no work in either direction. For a short while, the famous broadcast journalist Eric Severide, age 20 and unemployed, was one of the train wanderers. In his book, Not So Wild a Dream, Severide gives us this vivid description of life on the road during the 30s. A new social dimension, the great underground world, peopled by tens of thousands of white, black, brown, and yellow, who inhabit the jungle, eat from black and tin cans, find a warmth at night in boxcars, take the sun by day in flat cars, steal one day, beg with cap in hand the next, fight with fists and often razors, hold sexual intercourse under a blanket in a dark corner of the railroad car, wander from town to town, anxious for the next place, tired of it in a day, happy only when the wheels are clicking under them, the telephone poles slipping by. The rails were full of American children. They were refugees from families torn apart by despair, angry, violent, often brutal. Hard times had driven them away, and they flocked together, for in numbers there was greater safety both for the boys and the girls. There were boy tramps and there were girl tramps. And the girl tramps had learned quickly that safety in numbers could be found in boxcars. In case of illness, the boys and the girls would have friends to comfort and care for one another and to mitigate the fear of being alone and being spied on. Such was a subculture that we had spawned. But we were a self-reliant people, and we did not lose this article of faith easily. T.H. Watkins relates this story. In January 1930, an editorial appeared in the local Muncie, Indiana newspaper lamenting the suffering caused by the crash but imploring people to help others, to help themselves by make work projects. If you can afford it, the article implored, create odd jobs for the unemployed, not charity. Following this lead, the America's most popular home improvement magazine called The American Home published a list of 100 home improvement projects, everything from building a breakfast nook to covering heating pipes. We urge your consideration of the entire list of 100 suggestions, the editors asked, to find a few items that you can carry out, not only for your own sake, but for the benefit of those to whom charity is an unwelcome last resort. This was American self-reliance at its very best. Reaching out to the less fortunate in the face of the greatest economic challenge in our history. Unknowingly, that little paper in Muncie, Indiana, had reached the apex of the 10 degrees of charity formulated by the great sage Maimonides in the 12th century. The highest form of charity, according to that great 12th century philosopher and theologian, was to enable a person to provide for himself. American Home and Muncie were shining examples of this superlative value, which incidentally also fit the Hoover construct like a glove. Our self-reliant values found their other outlets for hope. Some in endurance contests, there were six-day roller derbies, talking and walking marathons, and of course, dance marathons. You may remember the graphic depiction of the dancers who dropped from exhaustion in a pitiable attempt to win cash prizes in the marathon dance contest in the film, They Shoot Horses, Don't They? One form of self-reliance was the Fuller Brush Company, and that worked. During the Depression, the number of door-to-door -door salesmen mushroomed. No home was immune, and the Fuller Brush Company sales climbed by $1 million a year during the very depths of the Depression. Fuller Brush salesmen were the constant butt of jokes. You may remember them, and particularly of radio humor. I remember one Fuller Brush character that visited, I think it was Fibber McGee and Molly, who kept repeating, a hope, a hope, a hope. But he sold them brushes. Fuller brush salesmen were a fixture, often pushy, hard sell, often unwelcome. In some towns, they were even prohibited from soliciting door to door without obtaining a license and being fingerprinted. But they successfully sold everything from soap to Bibles, and few homes were without an excess brush or two. I know we had a bunch of them. <laughs> 
something else was growing. Call it a kind of cooperative individualism, saying in effect that individuals can achieve a sense of independence and self-respect only by cooperating with one another. Call it a philosophy of sticking together, of participation, of belonging. Call it a reaction against the totally self-oriented 20s of Gatsby and Babbitt. What is clear is that in the 1930s, these values were appealing to ever-increasing portions of the middle class who were now for perhaps the first and perhaps the only time in our history feeling a kind of shared interest with blue collar laborers, the class below, as it were. A shining example of this was the Grapes of Wrath, how that swept the country, how the sentiment of that film and that book of Steinbeck was so in keeping with the sentiment of our country. It was the one and only time in our history. Now, there are many generous people during the Depression. My grandmother was one of them. She didn't live in the suburbs. She lived in Cleveland proper, and they weren't rich. And I often stayed with my grandparents where my parents went on vacation alone together. I remember that people seeking handouts would often come to her back door, and she would never, ever turn them away empty-handed. There was always soup. She would feed them something. Never a threat of violence. Never had any fear of it. But now all of the hungry were supine, which brings us to the River Rouge riots. In August 1931, Henry Ford had shut down his River Rouge plant to retool, this time from the Model A Ford to the Ford V8. When he had shut down in 1927 to retool from the Model T to the Model A, he had actually caused a minor recession nationally, but it was a major recession at that time in Detroit. And that was in good times. This time, in post-crash 1931, the laying off of tens of thousands of workers during the retooling proved to be a catastrophe. After retooling, Ford, perhaps unsure of demand for his Ford V8, did not even begin preliminary production until December 1931. When he did resume, pay, which had been $7 a day, was now dropped to $4 a day, and this time for 10 not eight hours a day. That amounted to $1,000 per man per year, which was about half of what was required for bare subsistence. Moreover, the speed up was already a Ford tradition. Increased production schedules with the same workers meant reduced costs. Besides, jobs were scarce. If you were unable to keep up, there were a hundred others waiting in line to take your place. Men shook with exhaustion, endured, hung on. They had to. It was a stress test of the highest magnitude and a matter of life and death for most. This marathon was for real. Henry Ford, the great Horatio Alger of the 20s, was now reviled by his employees and he feared for his life. He now absented himself from the plant, hired the infamous strong arm man, he's a goon, Harry Bennett, to run his factories. Bennett instituted an elaborate spy system that monitored all aspects of workers' comings and goings, even in bathrooms. It was a big brother atmosphere carried to the extreme contemplated in the novel 1984. Unions were simply not tolerated. Putative union organizers were summarily fired as troublemakers, purportedly hired by Jewish financiers in order to get their clutches on industry. Ford was notoriously anti-Semitic. In the 1920s, he published a series of 90 articles in his weekly newspaper, The Dearborn Independent, vilifying the Jews as the source of an international banking conspiracy. Ford's articles often parroted the notorious Protocols of the Wise Men of Zion, which is a vicious anti-Semitic fraud originated by the Russian secret police during the Russo-Japanese War in 1904. It was widely circulated by extremist hate groups, particularly in Europe. Ford was reportedly idolized by Adolf Hitler. In fact, Ford's editorials were found by one reporter pinned to the wall of Adolf Hitler's office in the mid-20s. In the 1920s and all the way through the 1960s and 1970s, Jews were reluctant to buy Fords or Ford products. Jews seen driving Fords were often ostracized by their peers. 
despite numerous apologies, particularly by Edsel Ford, retractions by Ford and the Ford family, remnants of the stigma remain, some of them even to this day. A hunger strike was begun against Ford in March 7, 1932. This was the beginning of the River Rouge riot problem. The strikers had specific grievances. They demanded abolition of Bennett's spy system, a reduction in the speed up of production, a seven-hour day, and the right to organize. Now, unfortunately, a small but vocal and highly organized cadre of communists now made their presence known. A group calling itself the Detroit Unemployed Council sponsored a protest march on March 7, 1932. It formed in Detroit, but its destination was Gate 3 of the River Rouge plant in Dearborn, just beyond the Detroit city line. The group had obtained a permit from Mayor Frank Murphy of Detroit, but they had not obtained one from the mayor of Dearborn, who, it turns out, was named Clyde Ford. Clyde Ford was not only a distant relative of Ford, he was a Ford dealer to boot. The crafty Harry Bennett took few chances. Now the marchers crossed the Detroit line, and they now reached Dearborn. When they did so, the acting chief of police demanded to see their permit. The marcher shouted back, we don't need one, and moved across the Dearborn line down Miller Road toward Gate 3 a few hundred yards away. The police then fired tear gas at the crowd, but the wind swirled it around, and the tear gas began to fell policemen and marchers indiscriminately. But the marchers answered the volley of tear gas by picking up pieces of slag and rock and hurling them at the police, dropping the police chief among others. Now the marchers ran toward gate three. From an overpass, Bennett's firefighters began spraying the crowd with fire hoses. It was freezing cold. The temperature stood at zero. This was a Ford tactic which employees in the crowd had witnessed before during the brutal shape-ups. It might have been effective to break up the marchers had Harry Bennett not himself decided to intervene. Bennett had been inside the plant giving the governor of Michigan a private showing of the latest Ford movie. Ford had its own movie production company. He abruptly left by automobile for the scene of the march. When Bennett reached the scene of the car park, he jumped out of the car and accosted the first marcher he saw, who turned out to be Joseph York, a young leader of the Young Communists. Bennett was immediately struck by a large piece of slag, and he fell to the ground, bleeding profusely, but dragging poor York with him. At this, machine guns on the overpass opened up, killing York, spraying bullets indiscriminately into the crowd. As a result, four marchers were killed, including a 16-year-old boy, and over 60 were wounded. The wounded were rounded up by Dearborn police and jailed. Some of the luckless wounded prisoners were even chained to their cots in their cells and refused treatment. National sentiment tended to side with the marchers. Five days later, there was another march. This time, it was a funeral march in the streets of Detroit for Joseph York and the other slain workers. There were at least 15,000 mourners by some counts. Others estimated the crowd as high as 30,000. But the leadership of this march was clear. The coffins were draped in red. Many of the marchers wore red armbands, carried communist banners. They even played the Internationale. T.H. Watkins noted that the Communist Party in the United States would never again march in such numbers or be given quite so large a measure of public sympathy as at that time. Now, but two years later, two years after Ford had been voted the most admired man since Jesus Christ and Napoleon Bonaparte, his strong-armed lieutenant, Harry Bennett, had to set up machine gun nests at Ford's estate, and not without good reason. The River Rouge riot in the freezing cold of Dearborn that March of 1932 was one of the major violent incidents following the market crash of October 1929, but it pales in comparison to another incident which began in the hot sweltering Washington sun less than three months later which brings us to the story of the Bonus Expeditionary Army. The participants in this drama were far different from those in Dearborn. These participants would have been appalled to hear themselves characterized as radicals or communists 
or anything but the most patriotic Americans alive. These participants came from all over the country, many by riding boxcars. Some even brought their wives and children. They were all veterans of the armed forces. Our country had sent them over to fight in the trenches of France and Belgium during World War I. We had euphemistically labeled them the American Expeditionary Force. Now, they were seeking to accelerate payment of a $4 billion bonus, which Congress had voted them in 1924 over Coolidge's veto. As enacted, however, the bonus was not payable until 1945. The bonus amounted to a dollar per day of service and a dollar and a quarter for every day of service overseas. All of the bonus money was placed in an endowment fund, earning interest until 1945, when it was estimated the veterans would receive an average of $1,000 apiece, some less depending on time and place of service. This state of affairs was not disturbed until 1929, when a freshman congressman from Texas named Wright Patman, seeking to curry favor with veterans groups, introduced legislation to accelerate payment. The crash had not yet come. The public took little notice. Even the American Legion failed to support Patman's bill, and the bill died without a whimper. But things changed. Following the market crash, Patman's cause was suddenly embraced by sources such as the Hearst newspapers and the radio priest, Father Charles Conlon, whose star was at this time in the ascendancy. So Patman reintroduced his bill in January 1931 with great fanfare. Now a great number of congressmen jumped on the bandwagon. By the summer of 1931, they presented Hoover with a significant budget problem. Despite the fact that he sympathized with the veterans, Hoover was convinced that the country just could not afford the $4 billion to fund the bonus at this time, without raising taxes or without going further in debt. Both houses passed a compromise bill in February 1931. And here's where the irrationality came in. They called for a partial immediate payment, but Hoover vetoed it, and then successfully defeated a congressional attempt at override. He was now beginning to be vilified by many as a tool of the bankers, a man against the common people. Hoover, the great engineer, the great humanitarian only two years before, was now becoming the butt of anger and frustration born out of desperation. The veterans were bitter. Now is when they needed their bonus most. They were destitute, they were hungry. And for those who couldn't find work, four to five hundred dollars would have meant the difference between food and shelter or starvation and homelessness for their families for as much as five months. They weren't begging, they weren't seeking welfare, they shouted. They were just asking for what was theirs, for having served their country well and having put their lives on the line just 15 years earlier. A veteran named Walter Waters from Portland, Oregon, had served as a medic in the 146th Field Artillery. Following his discharge, Waters had drifted from one low-level job to another until being laid off by a canning factory in January 1930. The veterans began to organize under Waters and mockingly labeled themselves the Bonus Expeditionary Force, or BEF. Many contemporaries and historians simply refer to it as the Bonus Army. Veterans in Portland, led by Waters, as Portland, Oregon, decided to go to Washington to present their grievances to Congress in person. After all, big business hired lobbyists, so they'd be their own lobby. But they couldn't afford the transportation. So they simply blockaded the tracks of the Union Pacific Railroad in Portland, Oregon, commandeered several boxcars, and began their trek to the east. By the time they reached Pocatello, Idaho, Waters had been appointed commander-in-chief of the so-called expeditionary force, and their ranks were growing. Their ranks continued to grow all across the country, as did the publicity surrounding their mission. Eighteen days later, a greatly expanded BEF landed in Washington. There had been a groundswell of support across the country. In Washington, they caught a break. Pelham G. Glassford, the chief of the Metropolitan Police, was himself a decorated veteran. He received them warmly, arranged for them to be vivouacked in an old vacant government building, and even set up a commissary to feed them. The commissary was financed by private donations, including those of Glassford himself, the Metropolitan Police Chief, who was promptly elected treasurer of the BEF 
Donations soon poured in from veterans and other sympathetic Americans all over the country. There was a serene and uneventful atmosphere surrounding the whole affair, almost like a false peace. This lasted for weeks as thousands more veterans now found their way to the Capitol. By mid-June, estimates of their numbers ranged from 15 to 20,000. By this time, however, they were forbidden by the Metropolitan Police from living in the abandoned government buildings, which were deemed unsafe. And they had been spread out among 27 camps of one sort or another in and around the Capital District. The most important and significant of these was one called Anacostia in an area across the bridge from D.C. called Anacostia. The bonus marches were now becoming a political force to be reckoned with. Congressmen took note. Legislation to accelerate payment of the bonus began to steamroller through the House. On June 15th, the House passed the bill by a vote of 209 to 176. Now it was the Senate's turn. 12,000 veterans massed outside the Senate sensing victory as debate went on into the evening hours. But when the Senate, at Hoover's urging, turned down the bill by a vote of 62 to 18, the men outside, all 12,000, began to sing America and then dispersed to the various encampments in and around the Capitol District. It was all orderly, quite moving actually. There was no violence. But the administration was fearful. Traditionally, our president attends the last session of Congress to adjourn the legislature before the summer. This time, Security advised against it, and Hoover stayed away. The congressmen themselves were advised to leave that last session through underground tunnels. They did not dare to venture out into the crowd of veterans who massed out front. But many of the veterans did not leave Washington. They were now homeless. They had no place to go. The largest of these veteran encampments was, of course, Anacostia. The camp, which was located on the flats directly across the Anacostia River from the city, had been designated for them and now housed an estimated 15,000 veterans, including about 1,100 women and children. The government had herded as many people as possible into this area across the bridge so as to empty government buildings, which were unsafe, but also for control purposes. Strategically, the government figured it could block the bridge if it need be and deny the veterans access to the city. As the summer wore on, Many of the men and their families were still reluctant to leave the D.C. area. The encampment in Acostia was massive and unsightly. Sanitation facilities, medical facilities, woefully inadequate. Drinking water had become unsafe. Disease was inevitable. Finally, in August, a number of veterans who could no longer tolerate conditions in Anacostia defied Glassford's orders, crossed over the bridge from Anacostia, and occupied several government structures in the area of 13th and B Streets. Although Hoover had been sympathetic to the plight of the veterans, had even quietly arranged a transportation allowance of $100,000 to help them return home, close to 10,000 veterans still remained in and around the district. On July 28th, the Metropolitan Police moved to clear the government buildings. At this point, Waters led a contingent of men to seize the Anacostia Bridge. A scuffle with the police broke out, the first violence of the entire episode. Several policemen were injured and two veterans were shot. Both veterans died. At this point, Hoover made a fatal blunder. He authorized Secretary of War Patrick Hurley to call in the Army. The Chief of Staff of the Army was General Douglas MacArthur. The written orders issued to MacArthur were strictly limited. Surround the affected area and clear it, but use all humanity consistent with the due execution of the order. What happened next has become the subject of myth and controversy. Many of the facts have no doubt been blown all out of proportion to what actually happened. One thing, however, is clear. MacArthur repeatedly disobeyed orders. He told his second in command, Dwight Eisenhower, that his true mandate was to rescue the nation from incipient revolution in the air. MacArthur massed troops, cavalry with glistening sabers drawn, and eight tanks. The soldiers and mounted troops pushed into a crowd of bystanders with bayonets thrusting, sabers slashing. 
In the considerable mayhem and confusion that ensued, there were cuts, severed ears, at least one bayonet wound. Tear gas was used on the veterans still remaining in the government buildings who had been pelting the army with bricks. The unarmed veterans, of course, were soon routed. Through it all, newspan, newsman Thomas Stokes remembered eight years later, General MacArthur, his chest glittering with medals, strode up and down the middle of Pennsylvania Avenue, flipping a riding crop against his neatly pressed breeches. Hoover was crestfallen when he heard the news. His orders had been defiantly disobeyed. Now he sent direct orders that MacArthur was not to cross the bridge into Anacostia. MacArthur, in a foreshadowing of events in North Korea two decades later, blatantly disregarded these orders as well and ordered his men to charge into the Anacostia encampment. Once there, they indiscriminately fired tear gas, but now their targets were the feckless veterans' families living there in shanties and tents. These by now included over 600 women and children. Fires broke out, not entirely clear how they started, but what is clear is that the troops did nothing to put them out. The conflagration consumed the entire encampment and reduced it to a smelly, smoldering heap of slag and ashes. The crushed marchers, dazed and disheveled, slowly wandered away from the capital. They eventually wound up tattered and torn at a campsite in Johnstown, Pennsylvania, where Eddie McCloskey, the mayor of Johnstown, agreed to house them in a Hoover-like humanitarian gesture. MacArthur later insisted that the burning was necessary so that the marchers would not return and force his soldiers to bivouac under the guns of traitors. He also is reported to have said that the marchers had intended to take over the country. The remnants of the marchers related nightmare stories of their ordeal, some undoubtedly more apocryphal than true. But together with the earlier myths spread by the Hearst Press and others, they became part of the legend and mystique surrounding this event. And as the word spread, Hoover's image was buried even deeper. Hoover here made another major error, which was certainly damaging to his presidency, and probably was the final nail in the coffin of his campaign for re-election. He was already running for re-election at this time. After the event, despite MacArthur's crass insubordination, Hoover took full responsibility for the events. Worse yet, in an attempt to justify to the public what had just happened, he did not even reprimand MacArthur, thereby establishing a regrettable precedent. Hoover's Secretary of War Hurley and other members of the administration continued to issue one contradictory statement after another in the weeks that followed, as Hoover's popularity, which had already been diminished by the Depression, now plummeted. Although Hoover was initially tolerant of the veterans' demands and restrained in his approach to them, his thinking changed after the rout. Eventually, long after his presidency had ended, Hoover came to believe that there was indeed a communist conspiracy to overthrow his government. Ironically, major Democratic leaders, such as Henry Rainey, who was the floor leader of the House, John Nance Garner, who became eventually vice president, Senate Democratic leader Joseph Robinson and FDR himself were all opposed to the bonus for a variety of reasons. Not the least among them was the opposition to Hoover's deficit spending and concern for the weakening of the currency by the printing of too much money. In fact, later when he was president, Roosevelt actually twice vetoed the bonus, although a modified form of it was finally adopted by law in 1936. The mythology surrounding the bonus march would change as time went on, always paralleling the political climate of the nation. During the 30s, the left liberal interpretation prevailed, placing the blame squarely on the shoulders of Hoover and the army. During the late 40s, and particularly in the early 50s, during the McCarthy shame, as anti-communist paranoia and Salem-like witch hunt hysteria swept the nation, the country witnessed yet another revisionist form of bonus march history. Now the conservative right was extolling the virtues of both Hoover, who was now an elder statesman, and MacArthur, who was now ensconced as commander of the United Nations forces in Korea. Both were lauded as staunch defenders of the nation's capital against the communist coup attempt in 1932. And regrettably, 
Neither MacArthur nor Hoover did anything to disabuse their supporters of their belief in these myths. In other more unified times, such as during World War II or in the late 1950s and 60s, the whole incident was looked upon more benignly simply as an unfortunate error. In August 1932, from his governor's suite in Albany, as FDR sat reading newspaper accounts of the tragic happenings in Anacostia, he reportedly mused over how the incident could have been handled he would have invited the leaders into the White House, sent coffee and sandwiches to the rest of the marchers. After the critical events in August, FDR now knew that his victory in November was a virtual certainty. Three months later, as the election results came in over the airways, confirming his prediction, FDR, listening at his home in Hyde Park, confided to his son James, you know, for most of my adult life, I've been afraid of only one thing, fire. Now, I'm afraid I can't do the job. Pray for me. And a desperate nation now prayed alongside them. Thank you.